Welcome everyone, I'm Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD. I wanna tell you about a recent survey that Medscape did on physician taxes. You need to check out this recent report. We talked to physicians about whether or not they're paying too much in tax. I know you know the answer to that already, but also what contributions they're taking. What's the chance of an audit? Well, joining me today to dig a little deeper and to talk about maybe what deductions you're missing, maybe how to pay less tax and what the tax code of the future may look like is Rob Scroggins. He's the principal at Scroggins Greer. Rob, thanks for joining me today to discuss an important topic, not necessarily the <laughs> one topic that they want to talk about, taxes. That's right. Well, happy to be here. Well, we found that doctors think they pay too much tax. That's not surprising. Everybody thinks they pay too much tax, don't they? But are there certain strategies to lower tax that physicians sometimes neglect? What, what do you recommend to your clients? Well, I mean, as we as we know, there a lot of the deductions from decades ago are gone. You know, as of the mid '80s, um, so there's just not as much that can be done on a personal return. And hopefully, doctors are taking advantage of everything they can there. The obvious ones: mortgage, interest, charitable contributions. You know, the the normal deductions. Um, where we find with our clients, um, their biggest advantage is as business owners, so they are able to take. The deductions oftentimes through the business if they're legitimate business deductions with the tax cuts and jobs act of 2017 the what we refer to as the two percent items those itemized deductions that were unreimbursed business expenses were eliminated so uh, doctors that were able to take those deductions in the past are no longer so those who were employees of health systems or otherwise incurred business expenses those went away but those who have their own practices can certainly take advantage of anything that's a legitimate business expense, meetings, conferences, meals, things that um, those expenses that uh, they can run through their business. What about physicians that are employees of a health system? Can they still take some business deductions such as CME or other conferences? What are they perhaps missing that mm -hmm. they're legally entitled to deduct? Well, they would be the the ones who have lost the ability to take those deductions. Now, they were all always limited to or had a threshold of 2% of adjusted gross income. So um, oftentimes, many of those expenses did not end up being deductible. Um, but where they can really uh, plan for that is as they take employed positions and working some of those expenses into their employment agreements where they uh, would the health system or their employer would agree to cover some of those, maybe in exchange for a slightly lower compensation. So that's where a lot of that's, in their situations, a matter of planning ahead. Do we spend too much time talking about federal tax as opposed to state and local tax? Are there not as much discretion in, in, in terms of your local taxes? Um, I, we certainly focus on the federal. That's where most of the dollars go. It's um, it's the tax everyone understands because mm -hmm. it's the same for all of us. Um, the state, uh, state and even local taxes um, do get overlooked, I guess, in favor of federal. But it is important because there are 50 different types of tax mm -hmm. returns for when it comes to the states. And then here where I am in Ohio, uh, we have a municipal tax uh, all over the, the state, which is really quite complicated. And that can make a big difference because that, that can range from nothing in some areas to two, three percent in others. So that does add up. Um, also, uh, some, you know, some states don't have any income tax. Do we all need to move there? <laughs> is that, that, right? is yeah, that valuable can... in the long run? There, there's a lot of mixed debate about right. moving your, your residence to avoid state tax. Does that really make a difference for most people? Um, it does when, you know, if you move from a, here in Ohio, our tax, top tax rates, 4%, but you go to the, some of the uh, states uh, on the coasts and it's quite a bit higher than that. Um, and so it does make a difference. We, uh, being in the Midwest, we see a lot of our clients relocate to Florida mm. in retirement. That's a tax, income tax-free sure. state. Um, but 
a lot of them don't have that choice because they're working and they they need to be be where they have their practice. So and there are strict rules on residency. I should point that, that out in, in terms of, uh, and that sometimes leads to our next question when we talk about residency. Really, the most dreaded word, as you know, other than tax, is audit. And our survey showed that eighteen percent of respondents said they were audited. So, is, is there something about being a physician? that makes one more likely to be audited? Or is it pretty arbitrary? Like what might trigger an audit for a, a filer? Yes, I don't, I, I really don't believe that there's a, there would be a targeting of physicians as a profession or a, a certain type of taxpayer. Um, what triggers the audits are um, figures on the tax return that are outliers. So it might be very high contributions that are not typical. Um, it could but how be do you a, know what's an outlier? <laughs> right? Well, is, it, is it your we, historical <laughs> precedence? Is it, you know, you, you can't really calculate necessarily what, what's an outlier. That's right. And I don't, and I couldn't uh, weigh in on how the IRS calculates mm -hmm. that either you know, or what, what flags uh, their system or jumps out. Um, I, I, we've seen when a, a taxpayer has a side business um, that's not making a profit, that can trigger an audit because that eventually uh, becomes uh, identified as a hobby in the eyes of the IRS. Okay. Any, uh, certainly if there's been uh, aggressive positions uh, taken by a taxpayer that had been audited, then they're going to be more, um, the IRS is going to be more in tune with yeah. those those individuals. Um, so I don't really know yeah. what they do behind the scenes. A lot of physicians use accountants, right? Someone else files it for them, prepares it and files it. So how do you know if your accountant is being too aggressive, right? Because that could trigger an audit as well. Are there any red flags in working with an accountant that viewers should be aware of? It's probably difficult for the physicians, not being tax people, to yeah. understand the intricacies of, you know, what's considered income, what's a valid deduction, you know, everything that needs to go into preparing the tax return. So I can see where it's difficult for them to uh, kind of notice something like a too aggressive mm -hmm. position. Um, I, I think it's going to come down to their general discernment in terms of uh, what kinds of questions their tax preparer is asking or not asking, um, or if there are suggestions of, well, you know, this is a, a gray area, so let's really, you know, push it here, you know, whatever they might say to pick up and uh, just question whether, you know, to say to the tax preparer that I want to make sure we're doing this properly and not being too aggressive. Now, most tax preparers are careful in that area because uh, one that's that is too aggressive on one return puts all yeah. of the clients at risk. Everybody wants um, to save money though, Rob. Nobody wants to, <laughs> to give their money away, right? So how do I know right. if it's gray? You said if it's gray, I, right. I might be inclined to well, take gray. Someone else may say, mm, yeah. I don't want any well, problems. I think it's where, the, where most of the gray areas are going to show up is on the business side of okay. tax filings. Uh, there aren't, like we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. So many of the deductions of years past are gone now. Um, so unless someone puts false information on a personal tax yeah. return, it's there's not a lot of um, wiggle room in there, I'd yeah. say, or many gray areas. Yeah. Um, where the gray areas show up mostly are the business side. And the, the general test there are whether uh, deductions taken are uh, customary, usual, ordinary, necessary, okay. the, that type of terminology. So um, to take a deduction that's mm -hmm. not related to the business or extravagant, um, yeah. uh, you know, lavish trips, things like that are likely going to get denied. But those would be the areas where there, you could say there's a gray area. What about the impact of investments? Do physicians think enough about the tax implication of capital gains, mutual funds, how should they think about that and maximize what they're entitled to? Well, and that's where they really need to lean into their investment advisor, unless they're doing that on their own, to watch uh, you know, the, the, the buys and sells throughout the year to make sure that they're trying to 
uh, wash out any gains with maybe selling some uh, investments that have gone down in value. Uh, a lot of times the investment advisor refer to that as tax loss harvesting. Mm -hmm. So if there are gains coming through and particularly with capital gain distributions from mutual funds, which often aren't, uh, the amount of those is not known till late in the year. And when we have a stock market uh, on the incline, which is not what we're experiencing this year, uh, then those distributions can be substantial. Mm -hmm. So if there's an opportunity to offset those with losses, that's certainly imp important. But I do think it's an area that can be overlooked unless uh, they or the doctor or his or her advisor is really watching over that. Um, so it, it is, it certainly adds to the tax burden, especially mm -hmm. as doctors uh, near retirement and investment accounts are more sizable. Those gains can be more impactful. What should I be doing now if I'm thinking of retirement in five years? I should talk um, to you well, right, <laughs> separately, right. I mean, but I, general principles. Well, yeah, the most important is is the planning piece of that um, to really start doing some uh, true, accurate projections and identify you know the income needs that are anticipated in retirement. Oftentimes, that goes up in the early years of retirement. You know, more money is spent than maybe anticipated, sure. but really good planning is the priority, and hopefully. Uh, the doctors have done a good job of saving over the years into retirement accounts, whether it's 401k or many of our clients now are also adding on a defined benefit plan. So as those assets are put away and they've grown tax deferred, that's going to be the income okay. source in retirement. And so it's also planned for how much needs to come out of those accounts and at what points in time um, is going to be important. Within five years of retirement, the um, the actual saving for retirement is uh, in the rearview mirror at that point, for the yeah. most part. And now it's going to, uh, you know, approaching the drawdown time. So hopefully the, the savings and the planning have gone well and, and they're well positioned yeah. to have the income they need in retirement. I hate to talk politics, Rob, but let's be realistic. Taxes are largely political and in terms of determined by Congress in terms of what rates may be. Do you see any significant changes that you would predict may occur in the tax code in the next two years prior to the next election? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, first, I'm surprised we haven't actually seen that in the first couple of years of the new administration. I think that I, I would have su suspected that was a an action that would have been taken. Especially higher tax. With, <laughs> higher tax. Correct. Or high income. Because at the end of 2017, with the I'd refer to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, and the AMT and all those things mm -hmm. we're talking about, the change the the marginal uh, rate structure also changed favorable to the higher uh, earning um, taxpayers. So that's where normally we'd see mm -hmm. a Democratic administration come in and uh, be in favor of raising rates. So I'm surprised that hasn't happened. And if the uh, some of the uh, political power shifts in Congress uh, after the midterms, uh, I think the chance of uh, taxes increasing uh, in the remaining two years of the Biden administration is probably fairly slim. Do you agree with the conventional wisdom that people will often say doctors are not good money managers? They're not good accountants. That's kind of been a prevailing um, wisdom. Well, do you agree with that? Um, thinking of those two questions uh, separately, in our client base, I've noticed some of our clients are quite good on the investment side, um, uh, perhaps just as the general population would be. Um, the doctors are very smart people. Um, oftentimes, they get a, a bad rap as not being business people, and they don't have a lot of that in their education. But what I've found is they're very intelligent. They can uh, absorb a lot of information uh, and, and understand it quite well, because that's what they do in their, their day job. And so with good advisors and good information, I think that leads to good decisions. So um, that, I think that they're probably also like the general population in terms of uh, saving and planning for the future. Uh, some do a very good job, like others and some don't do so well with that. Well, Rob, I'm going to end on a good note that you don't believe 
tax rates will increase. So that that is very <laughs> encouraging. I do I do not believe that, but none of us have a crystal ball. So <laughs> right. um, well, thank yeah. you for taking the time today to share your insights in, in terms of how physicians pay tax and, and what might be some of those areas on their tax return that they want to pay a little more attention to. So thank you. You're quite welcome. Good to be with you.